Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 3, High Sparrow. Could have used the, the High Sparrow. No, I kind of like it. It's quick and to the point. High Sparrow. No Drop nonsense. The, uh, Facebook. You're a little pretentious if you have the in front of your name. Like the Pope? Yeah, if we were the Nerd Soup, you know, that's kind of ridiculous. Just Nerd Soup. Our website is thenerdsoup.com. Well, that's because the domain yeah, is taken. Yeah, domains are taken. That's an adjustment we had to make to survive, really. Maybe the High Sparrow was taken. And we don't even use the fucking website. The artist formerly known as the High Sparrow? I've been posting some weird stuff on the website if you want to check it out. Some <laughs> yeah. weird conspiracies going on there. Okay. Birds aren't real. <laughs> Neither is the Sparrow. Now, I'm on record saying that I do enjoy Arya's arc in Season 5. So you can go back, confirm that, check let the, the record. Let the record show. Let the record show that I enjoy Arya in Season 5. But it's kind of like what you said on the previous review. I know where it's going. Yeah, I had a lot of that with the uh, Sansa stuff this episode. But um, the introduction is interesting. It is. Yeah, I mean... She's That's it. why I like it. Because yeah. this stuff is still intriguing. What's with, like, wise masters having people do household chores before they can fight. And Mr. Miyagi with the wax on, wax off. Now you have Arya with the sweeping. Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins. He's like, you ready to fight? He's like, I just walked like 37 miles to get here. <laughs> and he just punches him. Yeah. He, he's, he's like, your enemies don't wait. I, I can barely stand. Death does not wait for you to be ready. Death is not considerate warfare. And make no mistake. Here you face death. Batman, he, that's why he's so great. He, they got right to the point. Well, Ari is Batman of Westeros. But here, like you said, she's just sweeping the floors. And it is very mysterious. You see all the different gods. You have the Werewood God, the Stranger, the Drowned Woman. And yeah, she's, she's watching Jack and Hagar administer the gift of death to this man who might be suffering. Maybe he's terminally ill. I think he says that he made a deal with them. But all of this is interesting. The thing is, the House of Black and White and the Faceless Men, they are so mysterious. And when you pull back the curtain, it feels very hollow. It's not so black and white. It's not so, it's... Yeah. Actually, it kind of is black and white in that it's very plain. You it couldn't is... let me just have that? You couldn't have won along like it made sense? I'm sorry. Yeah, she sees the man get the gift and then he dies. So it's kind of like, oh, what's going on here? What did I do? Why am I here? You know, it's... I thought I was just going to be learning how to like change my face and doing all kinds of sick shit. This kind of sucks. I'm diving headfirst in that fucking well. Oh yeah, I'm taking fucking gallons of that. <laughs> Like, what, what are you saying, Jack? And what's the lesson? <laughs> Which one's the many-faced god? I see the stranger. I see the drowned god. I see the wayward face. There is only one god. A girl knows his name. And all men know his gift. Well, under the watch of the seven, we have Tommen and Marjorie being married. Marriage being administered by the High Septon, who's got a real stranglehold on his job. I can't see him being fired anytime soon. They're back at it, man. Tom and Marjorie, older brother dead, on to the next one. You know what's so beautiful about wedding scenes in film and television is just, you can really capture the essence of a mother's joy seeing their, their baby boy getting married, fulfilling his lifelong destiny. It, Cersei's eyes she, light up with the power of a thousand suns. You could just tell how proud she is. Like, oh, he finally found the right woman. I'm so happy for them, and I'll do nothing to railroad this relationship. <laughs> I do love how Tom and it's just, just loves having sex. Sex is great, right? BuzzFeed's 12 reasons I, <laughs> Tom and was me. It's those memes on Twitter. It's like, <laughs> yeah, sex is great, but you ever tried uh, exiling your mom yeah. <laughs> back to Castle Rock? <laughs> That's what Marjorie's saying, but she plays the game so well. She knows what she has. She knows she, she knows that she has Tommen in the palm of her hand, a 15-year-old boy having sex for the first time. He's going to fall in love. When you say the age, it's kind of like, it's kind of... <laughs> Illegal? Yeah. Yeah, well... I think that was one of the reasons why they probably recast the, uh, the actor, maybe a little older. It makes sense to recast him. The age kind of doesn't make sense, actually. I'm only saying 15 to make it seem better. <laughs> yeah. I feel like he's not even 15. Yeah, because Daenerys was aged up. Sansa never consummated with Tyrion, so. And he says that he would love to just do this all day, every day. And it's the weapon that Cersei tells Sansa about, and Marjorie knows how to use it. And she's also just very intelligent, the way that she's able to shift the conversation to, yeah, we're going to have a great time together. Oh, wait, you're just still a little boy. You're still mama's little boy. I'll show you mama's little boy. I'm just, a man. Yeah, he gets really he gets shaken up a little Hand bit. Give me that cup of water. I mean, Marjorie's just, Marjorie's just planting her seeds, inquiring about Cersei. Tommen kind of, was too. 
taking, uh, you know. But yeah, you could tell she's trying to cause a divide in their relationship. And then we see the next scene when Cersei's talking to Tom, and he's like, you know what's going <laughs> You know how you're always talking about how happy you were in Castle Rock? You should go there. Yeah. You should visit and never come back. Just to go back to the scene with Marjorie and Tommen, they really would have been happy together. And there's a great line where Tommen says, King Tommen, that sounds weird. He said, Queen Marjorie, does that sound weird to you? Marjorie's like, yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> never even thought of this before. Does Queen Marjorie sound strange to you? So strange. Husband. Wife. <laughs> she knows that Tommen is going to be a good man who will always treat her right. Yeah. But she becomes the most powerful person in the country. Yeah. Because she knows that he is just going to be her puppet. It's the perfect situation, except for the Cersei problem. Trying to dick Cheney him was what's happening here. Yeah, she really is. Better looking. Much. Ah, Cheney's kind of cute. I don't know. <laughs> kind of buff, you know. He's <laughs> got Bail. the dad bod. Uh, Bail Cheney. I love it. What'd you just say? Bale Cheney, not the real Cheney. <laughs> you said Hail Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to Marjorie. I love when, when he goes in for the kiss and she's like, all right, relax, kid. Oh, yeah. She was like, slow down. There's a great <laughs> line, too, later when she said, um, four times, don't you think we should slow down? We might break the record. He's like, well, what, what is the record? Maybe we can. But Cersei figures this out right away. Funny line, too, when she says, I don't know. Marjorie's very pretty. She smiles a lot. Do you think she's intelligent? I can't tell. But she knows. Yeah. At first, she was fooled a bit. He really cares about my happiness. He's like, well, what is this about? Like, no, nah, I didn't raise him that way. <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't raise you to care about the feelings of other people. And she goes right to Marjorie. And she's caught off guard here because I think she expects Marjorie to be alone. But Marjorie has the audience that she's entertaining. And we talk about the little finger virus scenes. This is just a beat down for Cersei. Yeah. Just wrong time, home field advantage for Marjorie. Well, she's showing off, you know. It's like the kid you hang out with that makes fun of you in front of everyone else, but when you're alone, he's the nicest kid in the world. She only she almost flies too close to the sun here. Yeah. Cersei stepped to her at the end. Well, that chirp about the wine, that's awesome. Oh, <laughs> great line. Can we bring you anything to eat or drink? I wish we had some wine for you. It's a bit early in the day for us. It's a little too early for us. <laughs> just Everything's just so passive-aggressive, but it's just these little jabs that Marjorie keeps hitting Cersei it's with. It's the cat fight in the alley, man. But they she comes up on in each other. Up. She comes up on her at the end a little. No, like, yeah, she stepped up. up. She's yeah. like, let's let's see how tough you are when it's just me and you. Yeah. Or when you're in a room with a bunch of other people and I plant a bunch of wildfire and then explode it. <laughs> but Marjorie's just on her game here, and this is why I love the character of Marjorie Terrell. What's what's not to like about her? I think she's one of my top three favorite players. Not necessarily characters. She might be in my top ten, but just watching her maneuver through the Game of Thrones is it's a delight. Yeah, she plays the game well. Talk about two of the better players over the last couple of seasons, Ramsey and Roos. They're playing a much different game. <laughs> More brutal, less sensual. You know when you enter someone's house and you're like, oh, make yourself at home. Bolton's wasted no time. They're hanging up flayed corpses. <laughs> it's a fucking mess. They're really... Murdering lords that don't pay their taxes. They're bringing the dread fort to Winterfell. Oh, yeah. Hell, yes. yeah. It's like it's been there forever. They're having this conversation, and you can see that Roose Bolton, a lot less ruthless than he is in the book, and we've said this before, but he's trying to teach Ramsay here. He's more practical. Yes. Yeah, he is. He, he'll get his hands dirty, but he's not going to skin you alive for not paying your taxes. Well, yeah, one of the lords Ramsay flayed is Lord Kerwin. I kind of call back to that with Lady Mormont when John's a knighted king in the north. And you, Lord Kerwin, your father was skinned alive by Ramsay Bolton. Still, you refuse the call. Ramsay Bolton skinned your father alive. That's a, I mean, there's no coming back for that, right? Like, how do you respect Lord Kerwin? <laughs> The son? When we see him, he's like, he looks like he's like twenty five years old. <laughs> he sat there. Once. Right. If it was, it was. If it was a boy. Yeah. Definitely. I thought about this too. That if somebody did that to my father, I'm not paying your fucking taxes. I'm going out with him. I'm pulling a dick on dick on Tarly. Yeah. You burn my dad. I burn too. I mean, I probably pay the tax. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't want the whole family line. Right. No right. Longer. Yeah. That's true. I'm doing it for the family at this point. It depends. Yeah. Right. It's family first. Yeah. But Ramsey, he's just he, he'll never learn. He's a character that's never going to learn. He's not going to change his way. Bruce Bolton tries to tell him the best way to earn allies is through marriage. What a disappointment this is. And going to the scene between Littlefinger and Sansa, Littlefinger's explanation here makes no sense. The power of persuasion is completely lost on me. There's no way that in this one scene, Sansa being so emotionally distraught goes from being not content, but she accepts her fate mm -hmm. as being a pawn in the Bolton's game. 
No way. Yeah, it makes no no sense for Sansa to agree with this. But before that, she figures out Littlefinger what his plan is, and she thinks it's a ruse. But then he tells her it's Ramsay. Like that's some kind of like, oh no, it's Ramsay. <laughs> like uh, not not the guy who shoved the sword in your brother's heart. His, his son. His spawn. His, it's bastard son. So that's better, right? But she refuses, and yeah, I, I don't know. He, like he tells her that to stop being a by, bystander. But that's kind of what she becomes, right? It's <laughs> it's like get in get in the game. Yeah, make a difference. Avenge your family by doing the same thing you did in season one and season two. Yeah, that's and why season four. It really doesn't make no sense, and we'll get I'll get more into it when you know the marriage scene happens. But the whole time, with other characters too, especially if you're if you're not going to criticize the writing and you're just going to take it for what it is, all these characters and all their mishaps have been portrayed to us have been mostly due to their own accord. With Sansa, it's everything bad that has happened to her is due to the, due to other people, and she finally breaks that mold. And for her to cycle back into that, it just doesn't really make sense. From a story standpoint. Yeah, it's a great point that she's just been a victim of circumstance. And she finally does get away from that. And Littlefinger says to her, you've been running all your life. Stop running. Okay, let's stop running and take me back to the Vale. It's pretty high up. I can stop running there. I can sit around. But Littlefinger's plan does change. And we'll get into that later in the season. But Sansa decides to ride off to go to Winterfell to meet with the Boltons. And Podrick and Brienne are spying on them. From Hot up on, on the, the trail. Hill. Yep. Hot on the trail. That's what they do this season. Although I think this might be my favorite scene between them because we learn about Podrick, his backstory, how he ended up in Tyrion's service. And we also learn about why Brienne loved Renly, what yeah. Renly did for her when she was a young girl. And I think this exchange is the best one that they've had so far. No, it is a great exchange. And Renly kind of gets forgotten. Cause yes, he does. We were talking about this when we were reviewing the first two seasons. That he's a really good character, and this just adds more to his character and the kind of person that he is. It gives the audience a quick reminder of who he was and why Brienne felt the way she did about him. So when she runs into Stannis later on in the season, that kind of gets brought up again because, you know, right now it's from Stannis, and Stannis is a fan favorite, but to kind of show Brienne's point of view... That's a nice little jolt. Yes, yes it is. And I made a mistake, I think, on a previous recording in season two or three, where I said that Brienne's love for Renly and Jaime was platonic. I don't think it was. I think she did love Renly, truly. And she knew that Renly would never love her because, obviously, he was into men. But he gave Brienne confidence in that room full of men that were mocking her and making fun of her. It allowed her to embrace who she was as a fighter, as a person, to gain that confidence, to become, like Podrick says, one of the best fighters in the Seven Kingdoms. And Podrick's story, too, is he saved because of his name. And that happens so much in, in the world of Westeros, where Tywin thought of it as a joke, almost, to send Podrick into Tyrion's service. But we see how much he did learn from Tyrion, and how loyal he is, how ready he is, how willing he is to learn to fight. I don't know, Podrick. I'm not saying he might be the next Jamie Lannister, but... <laughs> I don't think so. Hey, he's a, he's a project. We're a prospect. He's got one sword in his hand and another sword <laughs> between yep. his legs. Great line by Podrick when he says, I can't knight to you. But I can teach you how to fight. I suppose that's more important. And I think that gets lost so much in Westeros. It's everybody looks at the title rather than the actual person. Well, it's the Hound's whole philosophy. Yeah. If my brother could be a knight, then that really means nothing to me. Yeah. And talking about Stannis, Brienne vows to avenge Renly and kill Stannis. That Stannis is just a man. And now John, we have John talking to the man who claims to be king. And this is where Jon refuses his, refuses Stannis' offer. He says, I will not be Jon Stark. My place is here. I love, like, the even though they disagree here, Stannis doesn't get what he wants. He doesn't, even when Jon refuses, he's like, all right, I'm not going to change your mind. He just moves on with it, and it just speaks to the man Stannis is. And even brings up, he compares his honor to that of Ned and says that's what got him killed. <laughs> he wasn't, wasn't really a compliment. But it's, uh, yeah, straight to the point. Jon refuses, and Stannis kind of walks away and he leaves and like many times leaves Davos fighting his battles for him. And I think Stannis probably should have fought harder to get Jon to change his mind, but Stannis has some of that stubbornness in him as well, some of that Ned Stark honor. I think that's why they respected each other and I think like you said that's why Stannis and Jon respect each other in this scene. Even Jon saying, "This is Ali, he's my squire. I want him to listen, to learn from great men." Stannis is like, "Oh, thanks for the compliment." <laughs> And this scene kind of does set up the relationship going forward between Davos and Jon, and it foreshadows that Davos will become one of Jon's main advisors, probably the man he trusts the most, besides maybe Sam. Well, even Stannis here, he gives Jon some advice as well about Alistair and what to do with him. It's just that like mutual respect they have for each other where 
even though he refused you and he's not going to do anything to convince you otherwise, he'll still leave you with a bit of advice. Great line about enemies. I thought you were supposed to keep your enemies close. The man who said that probably didn't have many enemies. I heard it was best to keep your enemies close. Whoever said that didn't have many enemies. I like the change, too, of making Davos an advisor to Jon, because like Tyrion with Daenerys, when he finds Daenerys, Davos finding Jon, he has a leader that he can serve and that he can believe in. Well, Davos tells Jon that Stannis believes in him. Yes. So, And Davos tries to convince him otherwise, and I don't know, I think he should have went with the hand thing again. That really worked well, and Bravos. You know, <laughs> just whip out the hand and maybe you have Jon Stark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that worked, and maybe it was like an Obi-Wan... <laughs> You will become John Stark. You just see it, and you're like, wow, Stannis must be a prick. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to yeah. give him a lot of money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it is ironic how we have John can't embrace his heritage as a Stark, and Arya is going through the same thing in the House of Black and White, where we have the Waif, the first real appearance from the Waif. The Waif sucks. She sucks. In the book, she's kind of not like this. She's just like kind of the Waif. Yeah. Just doing waif things. Um, yeah, but this waif sucks. This waif sucks, yes. Just starts beating her for no reason. And Jacken steps in and saves Arya. Says that she's not ready. He looks at her clothes, her weapons, her silver. All of this is Arya Stark. You really must become no one. Well, this leads Arya to get rid of all of her belongings, but except for Needle. And it's a very... It's a sword, but it's still like an emotional scene because of what the sword represents. I've said before, this is the scene that always makes me tear up. Yeah. Oh, with the music, and yeah, it's what the sword represents. It's the I, last thing that she has from Winterfell. The thing that Jon Snow, her favorite brother, gave to her. It's so weird how this show like makes you care about weapons. Because like, even in Hardhome, when Jon goes out to stop the the, uh, the strike from one of the White Walkers, I wasn't even thinking of Jon at that point. I'm like, oh no, they can't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't break Long Claw. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Jon could die, but just yeah. pass on the sword. It's like, oh, why'd you pick that up, you idiot? Rather your head get chopped off. And when you think about that scene in season one, episode two, when John gifts Arya Needle, it's the only scene that they share together. That and uh, the arrival, I think, of Robert Baratheon. Just from that little scene, that you see how much love that they share between them, and it is more than just a weapon. And when you see it, you get emotional as a member of the audience because you remember that moment. And for that callback to be so emotionally poignant just speaks to the development of these two characters. But she obviously hides Needle. Maybe a little better at hiding. Maybe under some loose rocks that might blow away in a, like a strong gust of wind. Yeah. But, somebody stole that. Yeah. It's like when I used to go to the gym and just like hide my locker room key on a top shelf. <laughs> like nobody's getting that. <laughs> when she returns and Jack in takes her to where they bring the bodies. You know, now she's getting somewhere. Yeah, she's starting to learn. Like I said before, this is creepy. The coroner's office. Preparing the bodies for their faces to be ripped off, to be used by the assassins. Might not be the worst way. You kind of live on, you know? Yeah, I guess you can look at it like that. Yeah, it's a second life. <laughs> people wearing your face. That's, that's, so most people just get buried or burned. You sure know? Dahmer would agree with that, yeah. <laughs> that's boring. Use my face for some magic. Yeah, just just dump me off somewhere. Yeah, just throw, throw me, me into the ocean. Throw me in the trash. <laughs> and the first meeting here between Sansa and Ramsay. Yeah, when she meets Rue, she kind of like grills him for a little, but then... Says, uh, the Lannisters send your regards. <laughs> yeah, she should have dabs him. She should have done one of those, but then she introduces herself pro properly to Lord Bolton and then she meets Ramsay. Little curtsy. And yeah, Ramsay, every time, like, I guess because we know what he's capable of, he just looks like a little fucking shit here. And he can't hide it. No. There's like that creepy smile. Yeah. Even dead eyes. People who don't know who he is are probably thinking, oh, there's something off with this guy. Yeah. He might be all right, but there's just something, something's not right. And Sansa is brought to her room, and she's looking around the castle and reminiscing about her childhood growing up in Winterfell. Even though it's under these circumstances, it's still home. Yeah. It's always going to be home. A little grimmer. <laughs> Seriously, they need to get these LED lights. Yeah, but then her, I guess, what would you call her? Old. Old, old person. <laughs> the older woman. Yeah. And she tells her that the North remembers. It's a little glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm. That even though she's surrounded by people who destroyed her family... People still remember what the Starks were. And that's why, like you said before, when the Boltons, they're just, it, it's not that easy. The Starks have been ruling there for thousands of years. So it's one thing to root out the family. It's a whole nother thing to root out their memory. That's almost impossible to snuff out. That takes a couple generations. Well, that's why they need Sansa. Right. I think this is probably my favorite scene of the episode. Um, just to skip to the end of the scene to watch Jon Snow avenge Ned. Because Janos Lint was one of the men who betrayed Ned. Yeah. 
but everything leading up to this is great. To see Jon Snow in command, he's a natural. Yeah, I mean, he's joking around about the, what is it, latrine pits? Liter- yeah, right. Yeah. Gives and it to Brian. He's perfect for the job. <laughs> and uh, he gives Alistair the honor of being first ranger, which is a smart move because, you know, it's no secret that they had their problems with each other, but he can still recognize that Sir Alistair is an integral part of the Night's Watch, and he has deserved his position. So it's kind of... You know, it's kind of like what he said to Stannis, keeping his enemies closer, but kind of showing them the right respect. Yeah, team of rivals by promoting Alice Thorne. Alice Thorne does eventually betray him. But John, he just he, tr- he tries to take the high road and build bridges with people he would consider an adversary because he knows that they need to be united. Yeah. Even Alice Thorne, I think, respects John in this moment because he's kind of slouching, and when he names him First Ranger, he kind of puckers up his chest, and you can see he has a sense of pride. It's probably a job that he's wanted for a long time. Obviously, that's a basically second in command at that point. And then he commands Janos Lint to watch over Greyguard. And Janos is just a terrible man. <laughs> he's, <laughs> yeah. he's just a terrible character. I don't know how he got this far in life. Yeah. How did he rise up to the ranks? I mean, he just must have got really lucky. His little finger probably knew he, he could control <laughs> him and just right, feed yeah. his ego. But, um, yeah, even Alistair's like, dude, shut the fuck up. Yeah, <laughs> like, seriously. Because it's not even that he refuses the command. It's one thing to pull John aside. Hey, can you maybe think about giving me a better job? It's he's cursing him out in front of everybody. Yeah, John, you know, I dig a mean latrine pit. <laughs> I'll dig the fucking pit. Yeah. He's calling him a bastard. He's undermining his authority. And John Snow is a young man. He has to give off a presence of command. So he has no other choice but to execute him. I hate to be this guy. I do love this scene, but the book version is so much fucking better. Just the whole way it plays out, where it's John killing the boy and becoming the man. The whole thing where he says he's going to hang him, then he says no, and the whole everyone in the room is just going crazy. It's absolute madness. And then John says, Ed, fetch me my block, and he takes his... It's such a fucking... Such a great moment. This kind of little... The ending, like the actual act of him killing Janos and taking his head is awesome, but everything surrounding John at that moment, I think, is better done in the books, but it's still a great scene. Yeah, I still think it's awesome. The lead up when he says, Ali, fetch me my sword, and everybody leaves. They take Janos outside, and John's still inside, finishing his drink. It's such a great, quick little shot. Yeah. And when Stannis walks out as well, and he sees John, and he gives him the, the nod of approval, he's probably so turned on by this. Salise, yeah. Salise, <laughs> there's an execution happening. Get Shireen. I need to make this kid a Stark. I need to, this kid. <laughs> this kid is going places. Janos, man, like I say, he's such a coward. Does he fight? Is he a thinker? What What are your skills? I'm afraid. I've always been afraid. He has a lot of friends in King's Landing. <laughs> friends so, in high places. That's right. something. I'm 100% sure if you went up to Cersei and like, do you remember Janos Lynch? Like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> Yeah, we talked about the High Sept in, in the beginning of the episode when he administered the marriage between Tommen and Marjorie. Now he's enjoying some downtime. This is like a whole spectacle. They must hate when this guy comes in. Like, if you know the girl you want, just take her. Yeah. A whole it's, presentation. It's a little much. I guess that's why they're the best, though. <laughs> <laughs> they're like the Chuck E. Cheese of brothels. <laughs> You go down the uh, Jimmy's brothel down the street, you don't get any of the pageantry. <laughs> You're not getting the whole shebang. Yeah. And it's funny because Olivar knows who he's taking. So I have the maiden again and the stranger. <laughs> so that's, that's extra. Yeah, yeah, I know. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Just get out. And hey. these these sparrows, man, they're, they're awful. The people that I hate most in the world, people like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they give him the diet walk of shame. Not quite to the level of Cersei, but he's probably not having the best time. <laughs> No, no, he's he's probably not. Um, they're whipping him every time he tries to bundle up. They're like, nope, you're gonna show it. They want to see it. Yeah, that's it's just so embarrassing. The ignominy in which the High Septon goes out. Something that I would never want to experience. That's why I don't go to brothels or become a religious leader. Or yeah, no, because you can't you can't have fun. You know, yeah. everybody's judging you. And when he gets when he goes to visit Cersei, it's Pycelle who's the first one to defend him. You know, private man affairs should be kept private. <laughs> What are you doing, Pycelle? <laughs> well, we've seen. He's doing some weird shit. Yeah, he is. And when he addresses all of them and he goes to address uh, Kyburn. Your Grace, Grand Maester, Lord Tyrell, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm sure he, he goes to Cersei for help and under, like, wrong decision. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's Bandersnatch. 
<laughs> leave Westeros, go to Cersei for help. All he does here is just cook up a plan for Cersei, which is, I mean, Cersei is, she's a character that I love because she is so complex. And this is basically what she does in the book, too. It's obviously a little bit watered down. It's a, it's a bit more complex in the book. But <laughs> what, what is she thinking? She's like, oh, Lancel, Lancel can get in. This must be. <laughs> What kind of two-bit operation you're running here? But, uh, yeah, it's the introduction to one of the best villains I think the show has to offer. Jonathan Price Doesn't get the same recognition of Ramsay or Joffrey, but he's right up there, man. He should. I don't think, talking to mostly casual fans, mm-hmm. he's always brought up as characters that they hate. They never know who he is, and they kind of just associate all the religious people as one thing. But like, Ram- I hate those religious people. I mean, you can, I mean, Ramsay and Joffrey are great villains, but you can make the argument they're very one-note, where... The High Sparrow is very much more complex. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. And just from the introduction, you see him. Like, he's feeding uh, all the hungry people and the poor people of King's Landing. He has no shoes on because someone else needed him more. So humble. Yeah. He's one of those that he's so humble that he's arrogant. He'll tweet about how humble he is. It's <laughs> He really does. Yeah, he's always humble bragging. He's got the AirPods, the <laughs> Tesla charging on his screenshot. He's like the YouTube video of the guy, like a guy... Or one of these kids going around feeding the homeless and right. putting it on you. Some lady didn't have money for gas, so I gave her ten dollars. But waited for my boy to get the camera out. <laughs> yeah. You got the GoPro? <laughs> yeah. You got the GoFundMe link on the bottom? Just the way he talks, like you said, that but it's a charismatic arrogance where you're like, Yeah, I could probably join this guy's cult. <laughs> no, might, yeah, no, he, he might convince convincing. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very charismatic. I was like, this guy he makes me feel good about myself. Yeah. I want to be religious. <laughs> No, for the weak-minded, yeah, it's it's similar to Melisandre, and I think he's he's got that power of persuasion with words. Obviously, he's not as well built as Melisandre. The fact that she chooses this man over the High Septon, it's just such an extreme decision. Before even meeting him, too, she already said she arrested him and threw him in a black cell. Yeah, she she was way ahead. But I mean, she says like the whole her whole spiel about the faith and the crown being the two pillars. <laughs> It's, she's, it's, it's, I mean, that's part of why I like Cersei, too. She is very flawed, and it's her trying... A lot of it is the arc. It's one of the best parts of her character, this arc that she has to go through, where she becomes a protagonist in her own storyline when she's been hated on this whole time up until this point, and it gives you a new perspective on her, but yeah, right, it's her just trying to be a little too smart. Tywin's gone. She f- probably, and they talk about it later uh, with Ruse and Littlefinger, how the prestige of the Lannisters has taken such a massive hit since Tywin's gone. And it's kind of her just trying to overcompensate by... Putting tr- her faith in a bunch of extremists. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's really what it is. It's her trying to live up to Tywin's name. She does a much better job of it in season seven, but we have to do, we have to cut her some slack. She is learning on the fly. Yeah. And she's in a tough position right now with Marjorie. Marjorie's got the upper hand. There's not much she can do. Maybe if she would have thought it through, but like you said, it's Cersei. She's her own worst enemy. Well, and it's no, I mean, it's no coincidence that they showed that flashback scene of her with Maggie the Frog yeah. in the beginning of the season. That's kind of this coming into fruition with the younger queen kind of coming up on her now, and she's kind of probably a little rattled now. She's just trying to do something drastic to change the tides. Yeah, and she summons Littlefinger back to King's Landing, tells Kyburn to make sure that Littlefinger understands the importance of the word immediately. Kyburn says, yes, right away, Your Grace. He's writing the letter. And I was thrown off by this scene because I was, why are they focusing so much on him writing the letter? And then all of a sudden I jumped because the mountain with the head of the dwarf is coming alive. <laughs> No, we already. I told you, I'm holding on to that. I already told you that last no, episode. No, it's, just, not, it's not what happens. I'm gaslighting everybody. All right. <laughs> That's the head of the dwarf. <laughs> Good old Kyburn. And that letter reaches um, Littlefinger pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Time Let's is starting to, to become an illusion in Game of Thrones. <laughs> We've got it's, that happens all the time. It's I hate when people complain about. Wait that. a minute, is Jon Snow only Lord Commander for two weeks? It's a short reign. That's a, <laughs> it's a drizzle. Yeah, but you know he got a lot done. The latrine it's... pit didn't build himself. <laughs> the Jon Snow latrine pit, <laughs> yeah. named after Jon Snow. It's probably the same amount of time in the book, right? Close to it. Maybe yeah. a little more. Maybe. I don't know the exact timeline, but... Said he had a good reign, not a long one. <laughs> but here we have Littlefinger and Ramsay talking about Sansa, and Ramsay says he'll never hurt her, which, you know, I, I trust him. I believe him this time. Yeah, Littlefinger, so good at reading people. Well, he says he hasn't heard a lot about Ramsay, and that's a rarity. And we've argued about this on numerous occasions. Uh, Does it make sense? Doesn't Ramsay have a rep at this point? 
I would assume so, and I always held on to Littlefinger. I don't, I don't know. You were spin zoning the hell out of that. You were spinning yarn on that video. <laughs> I mean, any way you look at it, it's either Littlefinger knows what Ramsay is and he just puts Sansa in the situation because he's a scumbag and only cares about his own personal gain, which is true. Which, if you, <laughs> that's Littlefinger to a T. We might be putting too much emphasis on the Ramsay thing. That doesn't matter to Littlefinger. No. What's more important is the whole Roose Bolton, when the Vale and the North teamed up, they brought down a dynasty. Yeah, so or it's just bad writing where Littlefinger, who knows everything about everybody, just fails to know who Ramsay is. <laughs> but the writing, too, when he has the meeting with Cersei, Cersei gives him the leave to dispose of Roose Bolton in the North. So on one end, he's like, oh, we're, we're going to team up, me and you, Roose, and take down the Lannisters. But then he's like, I'm going to take down Roose, become Warden of the North, and then just take down the Lannisters. It could be just here. It's all very complicated. Yeah. Gaining the trust of Ruse, making it easier for him to take Winterfell and marry Sansa, kind of come in as a savior, uh, Prince Charming coming on in his white Why horse. Why did they do the book storyline? So much. When I was reading that final Sansa chapter in Feast for Crows and Littlefinger unveils his entire plan, I was like, this man's got a realistic shot yeah. of getting the Iron Throne. It's insane. And he was talking about the, to Ruse about gambles, right? Like Yes. But Littlefinger's gambles, he makes it so that the odds are always in his favor. They're not crapshoots like it's portrayed here as. Yeah, two big crapshoots. It's just rolling the dice, closing your eyes. Let's see how the cards play out. But he's also talking to Ruse about the implications of marrying Sansa to Ramsay, and he's questioning him about the Lannisters gave you everything if they found out you gave us Sansa, and all that implies. So, they, like I said before, they talk about how the Lannisters don't hold the same weight. That name doesn't really matter as much. Tywin's dead. A boy king rules the Seven Kingdoms. Marjorie is queen now. Jaime has one hand, and so on. It's just the name Lannister doesn't strike fear into people anymore. No, it doesn't. And we see that now with Tyrion in Volantis, one of their most important players for the Lannisters, and he's been exiled. And he's starting to go crazy in this little wheel box. And we kind of get a glimpse into what his life would have been like with Shay. Eventually, he probably just would have lost his mind. Because he just can't sit still. He's always got to be moving. He's always got to be thinking. He finally gets out. I love the exchange that they have when Tyrion says, The only face I've seen for days is yours. And Varys is like, I can't remember the last face I saw that wasn't yours. It's a perfectly good face. A little self-conscious there. I'm not pretty enough for you. But yeah, they get out, they walk around town, and they stumble upon a red priestess. On the long bridge of Volantis. Oh, Very yeah. famous bridge. It's the hot spot over there. It's no GW. It's no, no, it's no. Golden Gate? It's Throg's Neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our, our topical New York bridge references. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're New Yorkers. Um, yeah, we see that in Volantis that they still have slaves. This is one of the cities that hasn't been liberated by Daenerys Targaryen the breaker of chains, these people are still in chains, and we can see why they follow the Red Priests in Volantis, in Essos, why they're so popular, because they're telling them, we were once you. But now a new savior has come in the form of Daenerys Targaryen, born again from the flames. Very good speech. Yeah, and you could tell she has the tattoo on her face as well, signifying that she was, or signifying that she was a slave, so it's kind of one of their own speaking to them and giving them some hope. It's interesting to see like Tyrion's perspective here, just hearing this for the first time, hearing the reputation Daenerys has, the dragon queen that he has yet to meet, probably gives him some hope or some anticipation to finally meet her, hearing this. Yeah, definitely. And the look that the Red Priestess gives to him, it's one of those things that they just throw in there to piss me off. <laughs> what, what is that? Is it some sort of prophecy, like he's going to help Daenerys? Maybe she thinks he's cute. This is, <laughs> man, that that could be it. Yeah. It's like, damn, that's one good-looking man. It's <laughs> yeah. a man right there with that beard. It just, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Nice little, you know. Hint that Tyrion's Ooh. a Targaryen. Nah, oh, fuck you. You think it was a little bit of that? What? And Tyrion's a Targaryen? No. You don't believe that? You don't think that 1% true? No. Not at all? Even if George, like, wrote it, like, <laughs> I would still be like, that's bullshit. You're one of those? Yeah. You would headcanon it? <laughs> oh, it's not my Game of Thrones. Yeah, how it ruined my childhood. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just one of those little, like, you know, ooh, what's Tyrion going to do? Builds a little mystique, you know? Yeah, I mean, Tyrion's kind of freaked out by it. Or maybe she's like, hmm, I'm about to cash in and become a lord. <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, you think it's traveled that far, right? <laughs> yeah. It's even better luck to suck a dwarf's cock. Yeah, Tyrion's kind of freaked out, so he says, eh, let's go to a brothel. And 
<laughs> this scene is uh, a lot darker in the book. Hey, uh, welcome to the Volantis Brothel. How may I help you? Hey, can I get um, I'll get seven women, one guy dressed as the father, and the other six women dressed as the other seven gods? You, you guys do that here? But they all... <laughs> I want a stranger. I need a maiden. I need... Come on, you guys do that, right? We've only got like 12 fire gods in the back. Yeah. We've got Red Priestess and we've got Mother of Dragons. That's all we do here. <laughs> you don't you don't know what you got in Littlefinger's brothel until you're in Volantis. Yeah, until you're in the stinky brothels of Volantis. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's dressed the same. Tyrion finds out that he can't do it, though. Never trust looks. Until quite recently, I was one of the richest men in the world. <laughs> but who needs wealth when you can make a woman laugh? But he's able to impress the woman. He makes her laugh. And what he's telling her is the truth. I was once one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, some women like that. They prefer, you know, a little sense of humor. So, oh, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. All women. Yeah. If you can't make a woman laugh, then you better be loaded. To have both. Tyrion was killing it. With, yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in season one, season two. It's firing on all cylinders. Um, but she accepts and says, yeah, we're going to wash you off and can't bring himself. I think he sees in her. He sees Shay. Yeah. A skeptical mind, uh, a woman who's been put in a position where she has to be smarter than all of her peers in order to survive, kind of breaks his heart. You think Jorah for a second just sitting there looked up, was like, Khaleesi? It's like, oh, rats. Every two seconds. <laughs> yeah. Khaleesi? Is that you, Khaleesi? <laughs> nope, still me. Nope. Just <laughs> just the costume. Just I got it at a... Party City. Yeah. <laughs> Half off, off season. That's how you do it. You got to get it six months before Halloween. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be the best, the only one in Daenerys costume. Halloween in January. And the first time I saw this, I thought, oh, Jorah's trying to take Tyrion back home. So it could be any queen, could be Cersei, but it turns out to be Daenerys. And still in line with the books here. Obviously, their journey changes a little bit. I, I don't know what, which I like better. I guess because Winds isn't out yet, and we don't know what's going to happen with Jorah. But I think Jor- Jorah's just so, such a better character in the show. I know you hated that he gets grayscale. Yeah, I wasn't a fan, and we kind of see at the end it really doesn't do much. No, it was kind of for nothing. Yeah, because he's back to being just Jorah now. I'm pretty indifferent on it, but I do enjoy their time together. Jorah does take Tyrion in the books. They have a very different journey to Daenerys, but... Show's almost over. I'm sure there are girls inside who'd be happy to oblige. Made some kind of mistake. Why don't you tell me what you think you're doing and then... I'm taking you to the Queen. All right, so that's our review for season five. Yeah, it's fine. What would you give this out of five fines? Probably give this like three and a half fines out of five <laughs> fines. Yeah, three and a half fines. Three and it's a fine. Half. It's fine, yeah. It's fine. Hey guys, thank you for watching this video. And before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.